Welcome to the Gnostic Informant. I'm Jesus, the Logos Incarnate, and you are about to attain true Gnosis. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant, and I hope you're having a great summer so far, and uh, you are about to attain true gnosis. And I'm with Dr. Aaron Adair, data scientist, also someone who is well informed on ancient mythology and loves this biblical studies type of stuff that we do. T today, I mean, you and I have been you know, talking to each other for a long time about this, this topic of the planets being the gods, the number mm -hmm. seven being a you know being a divine number across the board throughout all the ancient. Um, got a little thing on my hat there. There we go. <laughs> um, but yeah, so this like this idea of you know the twelve constellations and the seven planets and where does this all come from? Where do we draw the line? When did the planets get named these things? Because if I'm not mistaken, this could have happened way later. But you're here to to wipe this thing clean figure and straighten all this out if i'm not mistaken at least shine some more light on the subject and of course i will include as many light and astronomy puns as i possibly can because that is my nature <laughs> yes yes this will be fun this will be fun so yeah I got you. Uh, you want me to pull uh, up yeah. Your... yeah yeah please do that yes okay all right so we're used to especially uh uh, nowadays that when you learn the names of the planets, you learn them and you find, oh yeah, they have these uh, names of these Roman deities. And we don't think, you know, too much of it, but of course, like any place, it has a history to it. Is it actually a human universal? Is it even just um, a Western universal? If we go East, West, and back in time, where do these names come from? And of course, are we naming them after gods because we think they actually are gods or uh, we just want to have some other association? So, before we, you know, figure out where our god names come from, it is worth noting it isn't some sort of grand human universal that the planets were always named after deities. So I'll give two examples from very roughly the same uh, time period, uh, basically right around like the same time that uh, we're interested in so many of our other holy texts. So we have a couple lists of planets and their names one set from China and one set that we find in Hebrew literature. And these names have nothing to do with deities. The version from China, this seems to be established during the Han dynasty, which is very roughly um, between like 200-ish BC and 200-ish AD. So very roughly, you know, like in time with like the late Roman Republic, the earlier Roman Empire. And the names of these planets 
are not after any deities, but actually are named after the five elements in wow. uh, Chinese uh, 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 alchemy. So I have the names up there. And uh, yeah, so Mercury, you know, the planet that's close to the sun that we know is, you know, super hot is the water star. Hmm. Boy, oh boy, is that not right. <laughs> I was just thinking, <laughs> that's an interesting way to put it. <laughs> yeah. Or on the other hand, Jupiter is the wood or tree planet or tree star. Wow. Now, clearly, they're not actually saying like, oh, yeah, that's actually a body up in space just covered in trees. They're just associating it with that element. Um, yep. And of course, in antiquity, they didn't know about Uranus and Neptune. So they right. don't have any ancient names. But since they have been discovered, uh, the Chinese basically have given them the names that are pretty much just a translation of our names. So, for example, um, Uranus in Greek mythology is the sky or the ruler of the sky. So the Chinese name Tianwangxing is literally... Um, king of the star or king of the heaven star yeah and same thing for neptune uh hai wang sing just like neptune he is literally the king of the seas that is literally his name in chinese nice so yeah the you know they're discovered that knowledge eventually comes over to the east and they basically you know there's always a few options when you translate you could translate it by a transliteration have the same kind of sounds translate it um keeping the original meaning or somehow make it useful to uh the meaning of the locals. In this case, they decided to just make a literal translation of the deity names. And like I say, otherwise though, the classical planets, they're all elemental. As for the Hebrew stuff, all most of the names are very descriptive and sometimes boring so. Like Mercury is just Kohab, hmm. literally star. Which star is that? Oh, that star star. Come on. They, they could have tried a little harder. <laughs> Uh, Venus is just the bright star. Mars is Ma'atam, uh, the red one. The ones that are a little bit more interesting, Jupiter is Zedek, meaning righteousness or, you know, the righteous one, which I guess is somewhat appropriate if it's going to be like this master star. It's association, of course, with Zeus and Jupiter of that time. And Saturn as uh, Shabbatai, because it's the restful, slow-moving one. If you follow Saturn from night to night, it's the one that moves the most slowly across the night, uh, across the background of the stars. So calling it the restful one is somewhat descriptive. Now, for the, for that verse in Isaiah where it talks about, I think it's Isaiah fourteen, mm -hmm. where it talks about Hillel ben Shechor, the you know the shining one, son of the dawn. Is that is that like another title for Venus, or is this a totally different thing? Uh, the thing is, like um, that title, uh, that name Hillel in particular, has actually been really far hard to find. Uh, yeah. in like Ugaritic or Akkadian literature to try to figure out what God or object this is supposed to be. And my guess, it's actually um, Isaiah doing a little punning on a similar word that means to be both bright and also to be boastful. So like you right. boastful, bright king, uh, oh, that, you're going down. That makes sense what you just said. That, that does fit. Yeah. Yeah. At least that's my hypothesis. I'm, yeah. I would hope a uh, someone much more expert in Semitic languages can say, now here are five ways you are wrong. <laughs> Right, but right. they're not here for us today, so you have to deal with my ignorance. Right. All right. Key thing, though, is we have many cultures that will have these much more descriptive names for the planets, not after deities. And in fact, we don't have to even leave the Mediterranean to find earlier forms of this among the Greeks. So first off, like the idea that, all right, we know the planet Venus, the Greeks would call it Aphrodite, but there's no way the most ancient or related Greek culture could have called it after Aphrodite because in the older Mycenaean culture, the ones that gave us Linear B uh, before the, Bron uh, the Bronze Age collapse, Aphrodite wasn't even in the Greek or pseudo-Greek pantheon. Yeah. That she's an imported goddess from the East. So right. yeah, they're definitely not going to name uh, that planet after a goddess that isn't even part of their system. And even more so uh, up until like, you know, getting like close to the time of Plato, the Greeks didn't even realize that, the two objects that they called the morning and evening star were actually the same object. So they had different names, different designations for them completely. So yeah, yeah again, no way they were going to call that Aphrodite uh, this far in the past. It was uh, ultimately a change. And it's hard to know exactly when some of the naming convention comes in, but there is a list of names for the planets that we find in a few different sources that suggest that maybe the older form of those names were also very descriptive rather than the god names. So, for example, there uh, one of the old names for Mercury is Stilbum. Uh, we find that in Cicero, Plutarch, in a work that's attributed to Aristotle, 
And that word just means to be gleaming, shimmering of some sort. Wow. Uh, so just saying, you know, that bright object over there. Venus, uh, again, has like the two different names of Phosphorus and Hesperus, the light bearer and evening, because which in, uh, which either it's the morning star. Which in Latin is Lucifer. Oh, yes. Yeah. Lucifer and Vesper. There would be the equivalent. Yes. Yeah. Um, Mars is just called uh, Pyrrhus, the fiery one, because makes also sense he is the red planet. And Jupiter and Saturn, in the older ones at least, they have the names of uh, Phaethon and Phainon. Uh, in some other later sources, they actually will even switch those names. Uh, it is worth noting that Phaethon is uh, also the name of a different deity who was supposed to be a son of Helios who tries driving his father's chariot, completely he fails. And, fails, and, yeah. Yeah, and Zeus is like, we're not going to have any of that, and, you know, kills him with a thunderbolt. Right. So now Jupiter is himself, <laughs> striking himself from his own, from the solar chariot of his dad. It, yeah, that clearly they're just giving these names as descriptive, not saying this actually is a god per se. Right. Um, Phosphorus and Hesperos were, you know, at least usually depicted as deities in Greek artwork. Well, but, I, was, I was actually going to ask, I was just going to say to you, I think that in their defense for, for separating the, the evening and the morning star, they're more it seems like they're more particularly focused on the phenomena and not mm -hmm. where it all what it all actually is and where it, the science behind it what they're yes. they're pointing out that this phenomena happens at this time so we're going to give it that that's a god so it doesn't matter if the ocean water comes into a and goes down a river and becomes another lake those are two separate deities they can just right right phenomenon this is another phenomenon therefore two deities and then, but a lot of times what's interesting is that you look at like Hesiod's um, genealogies and you'll have these gods that are related and it turns out they are related naturally through scientific means. Like mm -hmm. Son of the Dawn and, and is related to Venus and which is related to the light and the light, the light bringer. And they're all related, but which they are re actually, re re they really are related. So it's like, you almost have to wonder how much of this do they know and just were sort of being like you said, being descriptive of the phenomenon rather than actually what it all comes from. Yeah. And also it has to, in some ways matter to them in the first place. So like all these names of the planets that I have here, the oldest of these sources, it seems to go, you know, at least that we have goes back to Aristotle. Um, if you go to read um, Hesiod or Homer, there's really no description of like the planets of like Saturn and Jupiter with any descriptions that we can figure. Right. So it really might've just been the case that for the longest time for the Greeks, those stars just, didn't really matter to them. They couldn't like plant their crops by it. It didn't seem to have any right. correlation to any natural cycle. It was just uh, that light. <laughs> exactly. Yep. Exactly what I was trying to say. Yep. Yeah. Now, of course, eventually we know the Greeks will assign these uh, bodies to various gods. But even then, when they do that, it becomes a mixed bag. So... The sources I have here, there's a little bit of controversy with them. So the first one here, um, we don't actually know if Aristotle wrote this work called De Mundo. That's the Latin title for it. Uh, scholars go, uh, there's like two camps that whether this is actually Aristotle's work or it's pseudo Aristotle. But either way, it's an older uh, depiction of the systems. And the other one is someone claiming to be Plato, but most scholars think this is not Plato. So best case scenario, we actually have two students of Plato giving us their descriptions or arguments for the names of the planets. Uh, the one from Aristotle or pseudo-Aristotle actually shows that it wasn't even sure which god to actually assign to each one. So Mercury, Hermes, you know, would be the one that we most naturally think fits from uh, us calling it Mercury, but also apparently Apollo was used as a name. Venus, uh, some would say Aphrodite, and apparently Hera as well. Mars, Ares, the god of war, or Heracles. So mm -hmm. Some interesting controversy there that apparently it's indecisive which God ought to be the ones uh, related to those bodies. Sure. So, and, you know, it's again showing, you know, there's clearly not this, you know, like long tradition going back thousands and thousands of years that the Greeks have always associated the planets to these deities. It looks like this is something new and people haven't quite figured it out yet. They haven't standardized the system. And, and again, going, going back to the whole phenomena thing. Like, why would be, why would Mercury be so fast and have these sh famous shoes that allows him to go from point A to point B faster than any other of the gods? Well, look up in the sky, Mercury, you see it. It's the fastest revolving planet. Like it's so I, I you almost want to wonder if that planet in particular does have some truth behind the naming of it. If that makes sense. 
Well, it is interesting. So in this work of pseudo-Plato I have here, the person actually tries saying, first off, the planets are actually missing proper names. So um, he's going to argue what those names ought to be. Yeah. And in particular, he argues the planet that we call Mercury, it should be named after Hermes because it's the one that's best at following the sun for its quickness. Right. But the, then then you got to think that those two gods were always, always conflated as the same god, too. Often. Well, Mercury and uh, Hermes, yeah, were, you know, conflated, you know, very early on, but actually then connecting it to that body, this, you know, you see that it's ultimately now being argued in the fourth century BC. It was not, again, this old tradition. It was right. uh, this person trying to say, these names don't yet exist. Here's the ones that I'm going to argue are appropriate. And some of the name are, you know, or the reasons aren't even all that clear. So for example, um, he says that Venus, um, or in this case, we'll say Aphrodite, that's an appropriate name for that body because she's a Syrian lawgiver. But why does that actually say that that body should be called after Aphrodite? That is not at all clear, though he does seem to show the awareness that he knows still that Aphrodite is a foreign born right. god that came to the Greeks. Yeah. Um, Mars, he just says it's the red one. So yeah, call it after Aries. Again, there's like no argument. <laughs> and for Jupiter and Saturn, it's basically just, and you know, it's them. <laughs> right. It's like, you know, there's, you know, there's good philosophy, there's bad philosophy, and here there's just no argument at all. It's it's kind of disappointing for a platonic dialogue to have like no philosophical argument. Yeah, yeah, you you would think you would have a lot more behind this particular subject, you know? Yeah, um, but nonetheless, even in, you know, for both these students of Plato or likely students of Plato, they're giving somewhat similar lists and they seem to be suggesting some of these names are coming from what other people have said. So like there's some foreign reasoning uh, or, you know, non-Greek reasons that these names exist there. And at this time, there's now becoming more and more awareness and knowledge of what those guys out East have been knowing. Now, of course, this is before Alexander brings a whole lot more knowledge from East to West, but there's more and more awareness amongst uh, Plato and his academy about the knowledge of the Babylonians and the sorts of things they knew about astronomy. And it's there that we might see a clearer picture of where those names might be coming from. Uh, now, I have to say that the list here I'm creating is simplified because, one, there are lots and lots and lots of gods in these systems. Uh, apparently, even the ancients themselves got confused about how many gods there were, which one should be worshipped. Are these two gods actually the same god with different names? A lot of controversy there. Yeah. And sometimes these planet designations and god designations would also kind of flip around, maybe for certain seasons or certain planetary configurations. It's very complicated. So this, like I say, is kind of like the more stable, simplified version in Sumer and then later in the Akkadian or Babylonian records that we have. Yeah. Uh, some of them, you know, are ones we kind of know. It's like for Venus that we know that Venus is basically a descendant of Aphrodite, who is a descendant of Ishtar, who is a descendant of Inanna. And that yeah. connection then to the planet seems to be extremely ancient and very stable. That one seems to be pretty well, nice and solid. Um, Saturn also seems to be fairly well standard with, um, the god Ninurta, um, even when later on in like, uh, Babylonian religion, Ninurta becomes less and less important from the original pantheon, but he still gets to keep his planet apparently. Yeah. I'm surprised Enki isn't, then just by default, by, by, by a process of elimination, they didn't just say Mars is Enki. Yeah. Um, now yeah. when I tried actually looking up what was supposed to be the name for Mars, I have a question mark there because, there is a designation for it, but no one actually quite knows what it means or how proper to pronounce it. It's in its uh, Sumerian form. There just isn't enough evidence to tell how, how we should be interpreting it. Is it a god name? Is it a descriptive name? Is it just another way of referring to Nurgle? Um, I saw a suggestion that it might mean like the poisonous ones, which kind of relates to what Nurgle, a god of war and underworld, right. relates to as well. But that's so that's, it's that's fascinating that the gods' names or the 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 planets and the gods. Their attributes carry over to to Greco Roman world. So Mars being the plant, Mars is now the name of the planet that we know as Mars. But in the ancient world, Mars was a god of war. Now in the Sumerian text, Nergal is sort of the same attributes in a way. Um, some though he is a bit of a mix because he's both like related to war, but also to the underworld. So you think he'd also be like Hades? Sure, but, you know. Hades got nothing up in the sky, which of course makes sense. You wouldn't put a star of Hades in the sky if he's supposed to be in the underworld. <laughs> right, right, right. But all, but at the same time, you wouldn't expect him to be exactly the same because that would just be really too, really, yeah. really, really strange if it was that way. Because yeah. we're talking about thousands of years going by. 
Oh but yeah, there's all those transformations. And also it's worth noting that originally also Inanna and Ishtar were not just uh, goddesses of love, but also of war. So she's often depicted with lots of weaponry and uh, there's multiple reasons you would not want to fight her. <laughs> but when Aphrodite comes along, she basically gets totally nerfed by the Greeks. Don't you think this is evidence that the Greco-Roman mythologers were advanced in knowledge of the Sumerian, Sumerian st- uh, mythology? It seems like a lot of it must be descendant of it, um, whether it's directly from the Babylonian to um, uh, old Greek myths or maybe through the Hittites and a similar religions there because yeah, uh, could have there's some – Yeah, slowly, th- right. Yeah, there's, there's definitely you know, diffusion of these mythotypes. Um, the time frame and how you know it, what paths they took is you know uh, outside my knowledge base to are you know discuss competently. But from what I understand, there's you know a fairly good reason to think that the stories that were being told in the East transformed and translated across the continent. Right, and that but that with that so what we what we can say with certainty is that these ancient myths were held as so sacred that even when they were passed down to a different culture with a different language with a different con- the different ruler or different geography all that somehow the essence of this of these stories remained intact so you when you go you could start off with Isis and or Ishtar and Inanna but then you when you look at this myth in Illusionian mysteries you see the essence of the story still there or in in Egypt with with Isis and Osiris the same the same story basically and that shows you that there's something going on with the, the, the them held, holding these ancient myths as being completely sacred and 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 um and necessary to hold on to, even if it's translated and changed a little bit, or even a lot. I'm actually remembering because I was recently looking this up uh, on the channel uh, Craig and Ford, and he, his uh, yeah. a lot of the research he's done about uh, Proto Indo-European myth and language and that and. Right. Uh, the research that has gone into trying to, you know, reconstruct the oldest story that we possibly can find. Right. And it seems to be the story of the cosmic hunt. Um, yeah. That seems like it goes back at least 15,000 years before present and probably started in modern day Siberia and then translated across the world. And when it came to the Greeks, it seems like it translated itself and changed into the story of uh, Callisto, who was yeah. um, someone who was seduced by Zeus, transformed into a bear by Hera. And then just before she was killed by her own son, because she was a bear, uh, Zeus like taking her and putting her in the sky to become um, Ursa Major, the big bear in the sky. And then I think these Ephesians or Ionians, where we get the pre-Socratic Ionian philosophers, they, were, they must have known about these ancient Hittite myths that were passed down from the in Proto-Indo-Europeans and also through the east from the Sumerians. And so you, you, it's actually like, it actually works out where you see Artemis is like the, the, um, the state goddess of Ephesians. And she happens to represent a lot of these same motifs as the hunt myth. Mm -hmm. So you can see how the, the Anatolian world was probably one of the oldest surviving areas to, to have all this, ancient stuff getting passed down through that through geography basically oh yeah yeah that's probably a major exchange point with the the greek colonies in ionia there for example and then yeah. that coming then to yeah the various you, others <laughs> because you wonder why is it that this little area the south south uh west of turkey this ionian area ephesians and why is it right there there's this explosion of mathematics and science and astronomy and you get all these, I mean, uh, Pythagoras is born over there and it's like, I don't know. It just seems like there's a lot of stuff being passed down, a lot of knowledge being preserved and held, held on to and passed down. Whereas maybe other places, they didn't really care about preserving knowledge. They were caring about survival and other stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah, that, it definitely would have to probably depend on what they were prioritizing at the time. Um, yeah. And also to show maybe some other signs of these uh, ideas passing along. Um, it's worth noting like one of the gods here, Ninurta, in um, Sumer, he is not a chief god, but he does become an important god. So um, one of the stories that we have about Ninurta, the show, his importance and his prowess as a fighter and warrior is in the story of him fighting the Anzu bird. Um, the Anzu bird who had stolen the uh, Tablet of Destinies from Enlil, the uh, master of the universe. Well, at least he was the master of the universe until he took a bath and somebody stole the tablet of destinies from him. And 
from what I understand, the Tablet of Destinies was basically the infinity gauntlet of the Sumerian world. If you had that, you can basically control everything. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so Ninurta, you know, through some cunning and help, uh, figures out a way to defeat the Anzu bird and get the uh, tablets back. And so he was then granted not control over the universe, but at least a seat at the Divine Council. And Leo was still master of uh, the gods in this setup. And once you then, of course, get to the Akkadian uh, and Babylonian system where Marduk is now the chief god, not Enlil, um, Ninurta is still around, but Marduk was supposed to be the one who also um, was the great warrior god. So Ninurta is just kind of like, yeah, I'm here. Uh, what am I doing? But one of the other associations that Ninurta has or had was he was an agricultural deity. That he was related to farming, which might also sound a bit familiar if we remember that Kronos is also related to agriculture. The way yeah. that he attacked his father was with a scythe or sickle, which yeah, you know, is a tool of harvesting. Holding, yep, he's depicted as holding the scythe. Yep, And that's, um, that's interesting. That is very interesting. Yeah, and uh, the Athenians, they actually had a festival for Cronus. It was called the Cronia, and it's basically yeah. the older Greek version of the Saturnalia, though that's it took brilliant. place in summer. Yeah. Yeah, well, that is weird. Well, I, don't know, I wonder what happened with that change, why the, why the Saturnalia gets... For the Romans, it's in December, and for the Athenians, it's in the middle of the summer. You know what I mean? Yeah, that that's a uh, good question. How much of that is because of the different agricultural practices about which products were growing well in Greece versus Rome at the time? If it's because of influence from the Etruscans, that I honestly do not know enough to speak to. Hmm, interesting. Uh, but, uh, but nonetheless, that there's this agricultural festival to Kronos, an agricultural god, and Ninurta is also still agricultural, even though he loses his prominence as a warrior god because Marduk basically completely took control of that. Um, then it kind of makes sense then that the Greeks still saying like, all right, we're going to associate gods to the planets. Um, the guys over there are associating an agricultural god to that star. We'll also associate our agricultural god to that star. Hmm. So that's my best guess as to why they were doing that. Uh, why Saturn became Saturn versus another deity. Yeah. I almost want to, I've really been looking at this in non a descent story. And it seems to be the, 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 the new years was celebrated in April for the Sumerians. That was, I, I'm saying not, not April, but like what the month that we sit now know as April was their first month of the year. So they had a, they had, it was a little three month shift back and the Ikitu festival celebrates Marduk and Ishtar and like Ishtar's descent, Marduk's victory, victory, all that stuff basically gets celebrated in the new year's festival. And I almost wonder what, it, what is it about this? I guess you would say the spring equinox. That's so important that they would think this is the start of the year. Like, I guess maybe the crops growing. I mean, that's probably obvious, but. Oh yeah. This, the key thing is this is when you would start planting. Uh, yeah. Even today, uh, farmers start planting roughly April. Right. Yeah. If you start planting in February, unless you have a very strange climate, you probably are dooming your crop. <laughs> What? Yeah, um, a couple other quick notes here. Also that a lot of these stars or these planets will have all sorts of other designations. Some of them seem to be descriptive. Like one of the other descriptions for Saturn is um, this other term that suggests that he's like steady moving, kind of the same way that I mentioned with the Hebrews that they called Saturn uh, Shabbatai because it's restful, it's uh, steady in its motions. Again, it's the slowest moving of the planets against the stars. Uh, Jupiter has another designation in the Sumerian literature that suggests uh, basically seeing him at dawn time as being, you know, this, you know, great bright star to see then. So all these other descriptive names might be older than the god associations. Hard to know because, uh, you know, it's really hard to know what people said and what they thought before writing was even invented. <laughs> right. But there's one other mystery I think we have to also talk about because... Um, if you remember from our video from what a couple months ago when we talked about the electric universe stuff, yeah, uh, a lot of people were also like, but what about the stuff where the um, Babylonians say that Saturn is the sun? Hmm. Well, there is indeed a lot of truth that in a lot of the Greco Roman literature, they have all these associations that say Saturn is also the sun or the two can be somehow seen as the same. And this isn't something that they made up. We can also find it in Indian records. Mm. Uh, and it seems like it goes back at least to the eighth century in Akkadian texts. Now, that sounds, of course, kind of weird. You look at Saturn on a night where it's visible and the first thought you don't think is, oh, 
I can read by that. No, no, no. <laughs> right. So why would anyone ever associate that with the sun? Uh, yeah. The electric uh, universe people will say, ah, well, the Greeks and the, the ancients were saying that Saturn used to be a star. It used to be turned on, but now it's off now. <laughs> now, first off, there's this thing called physics that says that's not true. <laughs> right. That's one thing. But the other detail is just from basic grammar, the Sumerians didn't say, or the uh, the Babylonians didn't say Saturn was the sun. They say Saturn is the sun. So they're saying right now, they're looking at Saturn and associating it with the sun, not because of its past, but its current state. Hmm. So I wonder if the name they thought that after the sun does its course during the day, it takes a rest and goes all the way over where where the Jupiter, or I mean Saturn, is sitting, and they're like, "Oh, there's the sun. He's taking a break from his from his day job. He's just chilling over there." <laughs> Literally, his day I'm, job. I'm just guessing, you know. <laughs> Literally, right. Well, there's been definitely a lot of uh, guesses. Um, the one that I have found to be the most persuasive and seems to actually relate well to how the um, Akkadian sources will actually make these sorts of associations. Uh, and one of your previous guests as well about the um, celestial code, about basically the Babylonian Sumerian writers, they would look at their cuneiform text and basically try to undercover or uncover the secrets of the universe based on wordplay. Basically puns control the universe. <laughs> right. And one of the possibilities that might be going on there, this was uh, suggested by uh, one Assyriologist, Simo Parpolo, that the word that they used for Saturn uh, in um, Akkadian, uh, Kajumanu, meaning the steady one, it has the same root as the word for truth and justice, Kitu, which is usually associated with the, the sun. You know, the sun is usually the lawgiver. So we have like the same root word that can relate to both truth and therefore also with the sun and also steadiness that relates then to Saturn. Um, and apparently there's also some other texts as well that also say that the word for steady one, uh, Kajimanu, is also an epithet for the sun god Shamash. Hmm, interesting. So that's one plausible way of connecting it is ultimately that sort of wordplay. And there's a lot of precedent for that in the you know Sumerian, and, uh, Acad especially the Akkadian sources, that they would go back and forth and try to find homophones, uh, words that might have similar meaning in between Sumer Sumerian and Akkadian, um, related uh, uh, syn synonyms, try to find anything that connects there for looking for these sorts of mysteries. So yeah. this sort of what might look to us weird thing is something they normally did. And then you look at the, the two words, Shamash and Shabbat. Mm -hmm. You almost have, you almost wonder if is this sound, this is like some, some sounding thing where they sort of sound like they could be like brothers or something connected somehow. Shamash, Shabbat, Shamash, Shabbat. Mm -hmm. I don't know. That Shah so, in there. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, well, it is worth noting that the word Shabbat itself in Hebrew is derivative of an Akkadian word. That's very similar because uh, the the uh, the Babylonians also had um, in the middle of their month a Shabbat. Um, so instead of every seven days, it was like the middle day of the month, if memory serves. So that association of that word with a day of rest um, already existed in Akkadian sources. Yeah. Um, so like I said, that's one um, linguistic argument for it. And there's also a somewhat astronomical one. So So a bit of astronomical terminology for today is the synodic period. This is the amount of time it takes to see a body have the same relative position to the sun again. Like how many days will you see? And there's this angle between that body and the sun in the sky. Um, we know these like synodic in, um, periods are rather important. It seems to be part of the description of Inanna when she descends into the underworld and then reappears after several days. That seems to correspond to the synodic periods of the planet Venus itself. So it looks like that's important. And we have uh, Akkadian records of Saturn's period, which was about 380 days. And this, by the way, is very close to how long the sun takes to go through the sky. What's the period for the sun in the ideal form that's usually 360 days? So Saturn has the synodic period closest to that of the sun. So of all the planets in the sky, the one that's the most sun-like in terms of its motions would be Saturn. Hmm. Wow. So that might also be an astronomical reason why. Yeah, that's interesting. How and now, at least for, for seeing this, uh, for going back this far, eighth century BCE, right? Or maybe mm -hmm. before that. What sort of tools? How capable of seeing Saturn were were they? What did they see? Did they see? Were they, were they able to like 
do they have tools to see or are they just looking up at the sky literally like we do outside like how good can yeah. they see saturn you know what i mean well they're definitely not going to see the rings of saturn that right. was that completely happen. unknown until the telescope right. so everything has to be by naked eye um That's you cool. know you could do some simple measurements even with your hand if you take your thumb out and hold it like arm's distance away, it has a width of about half um, a degree. And your fist has a width when held out from arm's length of about, I think, five degrees. So you can do some extremely crude measurements literally by using the rule of thumb or your fist. <laughs> now, have you ever heard of this instrument that looks like a cross kind of, but it was an ancient instrument that they used to actually... It was like something you hold it up to your eye so you can like steady your eye more. Oh yeah. There's a, a few different variations on that. Um, the slightly more advanced version is like the astrolabe. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that's, that's a way that if you have then more precise measurements of angles. Sure. Um, uh, and the, the Babylonians, they also like had like uh, nomans. They basically had like a stick in the ground. and could use its shadow to also make measurements that way. Um, the Egyptians also, I believe used a, uh, not quite a pendulum, but basically a hanging mass at the end of a string and use that also for measuring the sky. So that way they could also orient things in particular when they were trying to orient the pyramids based on um, lines of sight with the stars. Yeah, I was actually I was actually to pull up a picture of what one of them might have looked like. Something like this. Probably just. Something, uh, yeah. Yeah. Something, something, yeah. Something that gives you lines that you can actually use to measure stuff with. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah, like I say, using your hand, you can get extremely crude measurements. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but obviously, this is if you want any precision. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, there's things, yeah, like um, astrolabes, armillary spheres, things like that that can give you measurements down to the degree or a fraction of a degree. The best measurements uh, of the night sky before the invention of the telescope was done by the Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe, who basically built instruments kind of like that um, or uh, sextants. But they were like what was his largest one? 20, 30 feet across. Oof. So he was able to get much more precise uh, measurements down to like, um, you know, a pretty small fraction of a degree. I think reliably down to what we would call a minute of arc, a 60th of a degree. Can you imagine how, how much of a mathematical mind you would need to do all these equations and, and figure out all these, all this stuff based off the, the primitive tools of like pieces of wood. Like that's all you got is you got a couple pieces of wood and you can fasten them together. And then the rest you got to figure out by like your intellect and your mind. And like, that is impressive. I just oh, yeah. They, oh yeah. <laughs> you know, it, it takes more than just a quick read of Euclid's elements to figure out exactly how to do all this. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Which yeah. Was, though which it is worth noting thing. that um, uh, since we mentioned Brahe, um, he's also famous for having a golden or bronze nose. He lost his nose in a duel about who is the better mathematician. <laughs> I swear to God, the more I learn about these ancient mathematicians, the more I'm like, these are the these are the more nuttier ones. Yeah. Than the, well, than I, well, uh, Tycho Brahe wasn't ancient. He was actually early modern. He's like in the late 16th, very early 17th century. Yeah. Like you got these circle drawers that will die making circles like stop <laughs> making circles or I'll kill you. No, I got to make more circles. Uh, yeah. Archimedes. Yeah. Archimedes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, some people draw circles and they get stabbed by the Romans. Other people draw circles and they control the rain, like Honey the Circle Maker. <laughs> yeah. Slightly less mathematical and sciencey, but still, it's all circles. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. So, while I can't claim that this mystery about Saturn is solved, there's at least some pretty plausible reasons why maybe the Babylonians were associating Saturn with the sun, and it has nothing requiring to change the fundamental laws of physics. It also, though, shows just how flexible they were with these sorts of identifications. So it seems like even for um, the Sumerians and the Babylonians, they weren't saying the planets themselves were the same thing as their planets. If anything, maybe the Trinitarian idea of, you know, God and Jesus being in hypostasis with each other, that, uh, you know, two aspects of the same body somehow, maybe that's a better description of what's going on because... It's also worth remembering all the various stories that the Greeks, the Romans, the Sumerians, the Babylonians had were of deities that were human-like, which you could also have intimate relationships and children with. You can't do that with a light in the sky. Right. 
So it's still the case that they're probably not just saying that light in the sky, um, that's uh, that's Aphrodite, that's Ishtar, and that's all she is, just that light in the sky. They have a much more expansive view than that. But even so then, do they actually think the planets themselves were deities, at least when we get to like the Greco-Roman period? And just like anything philosophers did back then, there was a debate. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, a lot of different views are actually summarized reasonably well by Cicero in his um, dialogue, which is, you know, literally on the nature of the gods. Great point. And, you know, you know, some people in there speak and say, and here's why we should think that the um, planets are gods. And then others are saying, how could you be so stupid to say that? That, <laughs> that book, by the way, there's a there's a um, an Oxford copy in English that you can read, which I have. It is basically like the ancient myth vision. Like you have, you have a stoic, you have a atheist, you have a full blown believer, and they're just duking it out with their with their with their arguments. Great book too. Oh yeah, yeah. So in there, among the things that we learn, and also in some ways, Cicero is also even our source to some of these um, uh, philosophies because, like, a lot of the works are just lost otherwise. Like, for example, uh, Sinocrates. Um, Cicero mentions him saying that the the planets were actually deities. Uh, but we otherwise have, you know, extremely little from him himself that basically we only get to even know about him. So Cicero can, you know, like pile on him and call him idiot for this. Um, and also like, you know, there's arguments in there that, hey, if we're calling the planets deities because there are these lights in the sky, then we should be saying the same thing about all the stars. So every single star is a deity. And if we're saying all lights are deities, then rainbows are deities. And that was the point that like everything's a god now and the word is meaningless. So kind of a reducto ad absurdum, slippery slope fallacy even. Yeah. Uh, and you also get kind of the view of what Cicero's is because in uh, what is, you know, you should call the dream of Scipio uh, in his uh, works on uh, politics in that vision where Scipio is taken up through the heavens to see, you know, how small the earth is and the cosmic scheme of things. And going through there, we actually learn that, for example, the planets are just basically these individual lights put into the spheres that um, orbit or rotate, I should say, about the earth. So it really seems like the lights in the sky literally are just that. They're lights stuck in a sphere that's rotating, not actual gods. Yeah. Um, now, if we want something a little less um, serious, there's Lucian's true story, uh, which is basically just, you know, him saying, I'm going to tell you his true story, but the only thing that's true about it is I'm going to tell you up front that I'm lying. <laughs> that's literally how the book starts. Wow. Um, and it has all sorts of crazy stories. So it has like um, the um, people going out past the pillars of Hercules into the Atlantic, um, reaching an island where the trees, if they touch you, they turn you into trees. Um, the men run away and they're shot up by a water spurt and they land on the moon. And they're greeted like, you know, heroic figures up there and they're enlisted into a battle. So apparently the people that live on the moon are going to have a war with the people who live on the sun for who controls Venus, the morning star. Uh, apparently it's literal territory that they can fight for. So you have these cabbage people on one side, you have giant spiders in their webs and the other all duking it out to try to, you know, uh, you know, fight who controls Venus. Right. Clearly to have this entire argument, this entire scene, you can't actually believe that the, these objects in the sky are literal deities. They are places that you could visit. So yeah. if anything, Lucian is doing science fiction um, with, you know, a lot of comedy. Interesting. Yeah, um, it's also worth noting that after that war, um, the men that were sent to the moon, they eventually find a way to come back to Earth where they then get swallowed by a whale and then they're trapped inside the whale for several years until they basically like light a fire and make the whale spit them out. <laughs> wow, it's like Job. Uh, yeah, it, but it's yeah, yeah it, it, it's, it's, it's half Job, half Pinocchio. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes. If And if you, you know, read that and really think it's a true story, well, you must have been born yesterday. You must be a real boy today. <laughs> yeah. And you almost wonder if the, the the Gnostic, not even Gnostic, even, even Christianity, where you got the seven heavens, the third, Paul is in the third layer of heaven. Mm -hmm. You almost have to wonder if there's, if there's some, something related to these orbits involved. Well, among the things in uh, back, actually, in the dream of Scipio, one of the things that Scipio notices as he's going through is the sound that he hears. It's like really loud because between the different spheres, there are certain harmonics and that becomes the harmony of the spheres. That's a Pythagorean thing, too. That goes back to the. Yeah. 
Yeah. So Harmony of the Spheres is where they go. And they, they have Apollo at the top of it all. It's the one controlling all the sounds. There's like, they have, there's like, an, there's like, I don't know. I don't know if it's ancient or not. I think it might, it might be a middle ages portrait of the Harmony of the Spheres where it shows Apollo is like, almost like he's like, they're almost like hinting that he's like some really great sovereign Lord of that, that no one knows about. Like, you know what I mean? Which happens yeah, a lot, I, by the way, Apollo is pretty, pretty important. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, Without seeing the depiction you mentioned, I can't be certain, but my guess would be that's probably medieval or early modern period, especially because yeah, yeah. one of the works of Johannes Kepler was um, Harmony of the Spheres, his um, planetary theory. Um, so everyone, you know, knew about this concept of the Harmony of the Spheres and trying to fit it in because they thought Pythagoras, you know, was this brilliant sage and what he says must have some sort of kernel of truth that we have to figure out. I actually found it so I can show people if anyone wants to know. I'll just play it, show it real quick. But yeah, you're right. It definitely is newer. It's not ancient. Um, yeah. That's what it looks like. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This. Uh... I wish I could make it bigger, but I can't because it's stream yard. Yeah. Uh, we have our limitations, but nonetheless, it's definitely medieval um, given the clarity of the names all in Latin, um, the use of the planetary symbols, which only really came into vogue in the uh, medieval period. Yeah, what year this book would be from, I can't guess, but I would say late medieval, maybe early modern period. Yeah. And there's this one too. But this is a little bit, this is more of like a astro astronomical map, I guess you would say, right? Oh, yeah. And oh, it's really hard to see if this is actually supposed to be. Okay. Yeah, it's still Earth centric. Okay. Yeah. I was trying to see if it was an early Copernican work, but no. This is some Ptolemy stuff right here. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah. So plenty of examples where the planets are places or things you could visit rather than deities. Um, right. And also it's worth noting, like in the astrological literature, like um, one of the um, early uh, astrological tomes we have from a guy by the name of Marcus Milinius, uh, uh, sorry, Manilius. Uh, he's basically writing at like the end of uh, Julius, not Julius, um, uh, Caesar Augustus's reign. Uh, right around then he's finishing his book and he seems to, you know, say you know really nice things about astrology and the importance of the planets but the gods themselves seem to be in the sphere above all the planetary spheres so they're in the highest heavens of all rather than associating them with the particular stars so the planets uh jupiter is not actually the god jupiter he you know where does jupiter really live he lives above all the other heavenly bodies wow and of course the the righteous will go and become stars and live in the temples of those gods as well. In particular, he's praising Julius Caesar. He praises Caesar Augustus as, um, you know, depending on which book it is, whether he will go and join him in the heavens or he is now in the heavens because it yeah. looks like he's writing right around the death of Augustus. So some of it was written before he died and some of it after. Yeah. Uh, and if you go to Ptolemy as well, he again will talk about, and this is the um, star of Aphrodite. This is the star of Zeus. Again, he doesn't say the planets actually are those gods. They're just the ones named after them. Yeah. That's fascinating. You got you to admit that this medieval art, this like Michelangelo, Donatello level of art is just could never be touched ever again, I don't think. Well, I don't know. Have you seen some of the most recent outputs from um, Dali 2? No, I haven't. I it's this really out. amazing um, uh, text-to-image uh, software that developed. Um, there's a couple different versions. There's also one that Google put out. And it's this amazing machine learning uh, tool that's popped out that literally you type in something and it generates an image from the text. Oh, yeah. I've, I've actually just heard about this. Yeah. That's going to that's gonna change the world of art as we know it. Yeah. It basically, well, it destroys freelance art, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, it does. You're right. It's, that's never going to be a thing ever again. Because AI is, AI is going to be the best artist ever. I'm hoping artists will use it and find ways to be interesting with it rather than yeah. have it be replaced by it. Good point. That's usually what humans do. When we built machines, we built the tractor. That didn't end farming. It just made farming a lot better. Yeah, you're right. You're actually absolutely a good point. Yeah. So for the sake of the artists, I hope it does not destroy them because, sure. well, I mean, we already have the phrase starving artist. We don't need like completely emaciated starving artist. Yeah, yeah. Extinct okay. artist, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, the world is better with artists in it. So yes. uh, before we go on, I don't know if we want to do any super chats. Oh, yeah, we can do super chats. Sure. Good idea. 
All right, we have a couple. So let's go to the top. And we have Imposter Sir Spence. Thank you for the super chat. Do you think Osiris deposed Amun-Ra in the same fashion as Zeus and Saturn? I've heard that they are hugely advanced in astronomy and saw the planets pass each other in the sky as most high. All right. So this would depend on a couple of things. So first off, I don't know of any Egyptian evidence that suggests Osiris took down Amun-Ra in the same way that Zeus took down um, Kronos. Yeah, just um, I'm not aware of it. Just to jump in real quick. The only thing I know about is that when Amun-Ra dies, he becomes Osiris in the underworld. So I think it's I think they're it's not a deposing, it's a passing of the torch. It's the opposite. Okay. But maybe that's what he meant, but yeah. Yeah. Well this it also gets confusing because also Osiris then will be related with Horus. Yeah. That, that Horus uh, it's the same <laughs> cycle. It have it just ha- it just yeah. it's it's a it's a post Ptolemy era where yeah. they start doing the but yeah. Right. Uh, and also it's worth noting that like the the myth of Kronos being defeated by Zeus is older than the designation of Zeus with the planet and with uh, Kronos with the planet. So uh, it seems like that those stories or those ideas are independent of each other. And from what I also understand, when it comes to Egyptian astronomy, they associated Osiris not with any of the planets per se, but usually they associated it with the constellation Orion. Um, Isis associated with um, Sirius. Um, uh, Later with planetary knowledge that probably changed, but I don't know the details very well there. Um, As for the uh, Egyptians being advanced in astronomy, a lot of the astronomy that the Egyptians will have learned will be what they absorbed, um, especially from the Babylonians. And then when the Greeks come down to Egypt and say, oh, look at all this advanced knowledge, look at what the Egyptians did, they aren't necessarily aware that a lot of that knowledge was transferred from Babylon to Egypt and then Egypt to Greece and Rome. Well, another thing I've heard from Matthew Monger, there's a possibility that there's Aranos and Zeus both mean sky, sky father. And then Saturn is in between them. He's basically a sky god too. So you almost wonder if there's are multiple gods from multiple different areas that are being unified into a one. And Hesiod's t- looking at these different myths. Like let's say the Romans have Aranos and the people in Dalmatia, they worship Saturn. I'm just, I'm just making stuff up right now. <laughs> but what he's doing is he's taking these multiple sky father myths and turning them into a a descendancy of each other if that makes sense that's a possibility i'm not saying that's true but that he threw that out there and i thought thought that that's definitely could be possible hmm. yeah i can't speak too much to that uh just you know i don't know what evidence there would be for or against that immediately it's it's definitely you know interesting speculation though it's also worth noting even zeus's place in the pantheon chain so i mentioned back in like um the older mycenaean uh text from uh, the, written in linear B in those texts. It also suggests that actually the top God wasn't Zeus, but Poseidon. Mm. So there's already some shifting of like, you know, who's right. in control by the time we get to Hesiod over those, you know, like 500, 800 years, or I forget how much time there is between the two, but you know, between like the next 500,000 years, you even change, you know, uh, who's actually the top dog. And <laughs> it's, wonderfully complicated and the evidence is so thin it's uh very hard to come to any definitive conclusions good point good point but yeah is that it for this question um i think we did okay answering it yeah uh, imposter if we did not imposter if we did not you have to send another 20 dollars to tell us how wrong we are <laughs> not don't do that but yeah but i really do appreciate the super chat and it's a really good question it's really thought-provoking yeah. it's definitely thought-provoking i hope if anything we gave you there is something to look into as far as these names of gods and why they had different roles. And it's definitely something that I I'm fascinated by as myself. So thank you for that. Um, the next one is Robert Herring with the $2 super sticker. Thank you, Robert. You know, you can always ask a question. You can always jump in the conversation, Robert. You always, you always drop them super stickers, but I appreciate having you around, man. It's really, really, really good friend. Thank you for that. Cindy Lamachia. Thank you for the super chat. How advanced were the Egyptians in astronomy? So it does depend on the time period, of course. Um, yeah. When it, I understand they were able to use the northern stars um, to 
uh, basically align the pyramids. So the Great Pyramids on the Giza Plateau, they are aligned reasonably well with North, and it seems like they were using the Pole Star and a bit of um, you know astronomical tooling to try to get the directions and the timing of uh, what they're trying to do pretty good. Um, it's also suggested the pyramids also have these shafts in them that go basically like from the central chambers outward, and they seem to be pointing to particular stars in the night sky that were important to them which would again suggest astronomical knowledge as well as amazing building construction. Building something that big and actually have it point in any correct direction is phenomenal. I'm pretty sure I could not do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, we in, in like the ancient past, we don't have um, too much info showing that they had like an interesting uh, theory of the planets or predictions of eclipses or things like that. It seems like the um, Babylonians were significantly more advanced on that front Um and then they had like the really good records of those sorts of things. The Egyptians weren't um, obviously, you know, completely ignorant of that, but it didn't seem like it was important in the same way it was to the Babylonians and then later to the Greeks um, who then, well, once they, you know, built like the Library of Alexandria and things like that, then Egypt, yeah, became an important astronomical hub. Yeah. And I would say that after the Achaemenid Empire, after that era, or even during that era, there's sort of a globalization of, of all this knowledge like you can see it's there's there's a lot of trading and a lot of commonalities happening before that that's where the question is that's when you who knows who was more advanced at that point i would say probably the babylonians but i would say the egyptians probably weren't that far behind or they might have been a little bit ahead who knows i think it's pretty close mm -hmm. but yeah right. so, let's, i think there's one more i think let me just make sure yes there it is Jesus ah. saves. Thank you for the super <laughs> chat. Uh, Trinity, sun, earth, and moon. What do you think? I at least don't know of any sources that tried such a direct association. Um, especially considering like if you go, you know, before like the times of uh, Plato and Aristotle, uh, the Greeks were flat earthers. So they wouldn't have seen the earth as a body like the sun and moon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I don't know of anything, and, and especially with the particular doctrines associated with the Trinity uh, and trying to have, you know, three persons in one sort of stuff. This, As far as I know, that was not something in any uh, ancient associations. But uh, if you know better, I would love to be disproven. <laughs> the only thing I know about is that there's the um, Emerald Tablet of Hermes or Thoth or whatever. Thoth, the, it's like this, you know, you ever heard of it, the Emerald Tablet? Yeah, though, uh, from what I understand, the, most of the sources or the oldest sources that even talk about it, I think, are from the Islamic period. Yeah, well, they found it. They found it. It's, it's a new, newer find. I think it's from, when did they find it? Yeah, Islamic period. I think that's when they found it. But um, well, at least, well, at least somebody said they found it in the same way people said they found this pillar that showed them that actually all the gods were humans in the past and things like that. Right. You got to... We, well, we have the, to be a bit careful. <laughs> well, no. Well the, well, the point I was getting at is in that text, there is some, it talks about there being his fit, his belly is the moon, his eye is the sun and his something mm. like that. Like there's like this like Trinitarian like vibe happening in there. Like sun, it's sun, earth and moon being sort of one deity mm. in that okay. text. So I, that's the only thing I can think of as far as to answer that question. But other than that, I've never, I, you know, I'm just, I'm just throwing stuff out there, you know? So, but that's not a Christian text or Islamic text either. That's just uh, some random. That's just like that's in its own <laughs> island. It's it's in its own category. The, the, yeah, I I think it's related to the Hermetic tradition, but I think yeah. oh, uh, Professor sure. Justin Sledge will be able to say a thousand times more about that than I will. <laughs> and yeah, he is. I think he's did a video on that particular subject. Which yeah, if he did, it's he probably knocked it out the park like he always does. Yeah, I remember actually, yeah, the video from that he did, it was, um, I at least know he did one video focused on the versions that were in Europe, and there are multiple crummy translations from the Arabic or or some other intermediate between that. And so there were multiple versions like floating around in medieval and early modern Europe. So uh, if you said you had a copy of the Emerald, tra uh, ta uh, the, yeah, Emerald Talbot, you would have to say, well, which one? Because like, you know, well, there's two or three different the, versions out there. The one, the one I have has like 20 versions in there. And they'll say, yeah. this one was from 1798 from Francis Bacon. By the way, Francis Bacon did translate it. He's one of the translators. And then there's like another one is from blah, 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 from 1522. This one's from 900. This one's from like, there's it just every, every, cause it's so short. 
It's only a page mm-hmm. long. So the whole book is just pages of different translations. So it's you get to compare yeah. and contrast them all. And w- boy, they are different. Very different. <laughs> so that's that's oh, the yeah. Part, yeah. But yeah, just uh, just to go back to the back to our topic. All right. All right. So at this point, you know, I've shown a bunch of sources that suggest like the naming convention to the planets that we know, you know, is kind of sort of late in the game that it really only starts to like show up like during the time of Plato and on. And, you know, well into the Roman Empire, it was still the case that these planets were not considered the gods. And even if they were considered gods at all, they weren't like saying that uh, planet over there, that is literally Jupiter, that is literally Zeus. It could be a god just because it moves around, but it's not the the almighty one. And most others would basically say, or at least the philosophically minded were suggesting they're objects, not deities. But as time goes on, things change. And by the late um, imperial period, it seems like there's starting to be a blurring of the lines between the deity and the star associated with that deity. So I have like this bit of a quote here from a fourth century astrologer, uh, Firmicus Maternus, um, and your audience might also be familiar with him because he's also uh, famous because he also wrote this big um, uh, book attacking various heresies and pagan worship after he became a Christian. Yep. And uh, so whether this book actually comes before or after that um, uh, against heresies book is uh, um, argued. But uh, in here, we have like this quote here that seems to be associating not just like Saturn with that light, but maybe he actually is that light or he is extremely intimately connected. So when they're saying like, you know, you Saturn, you're set at the highest point and you carry your leaded light, you carry this weight around as the light that is that planet, um, Jupiter, that, you know, they're associating him with the actual god Jupiter, but also he has control over the, in this case, second sphere, the sphere that controls the planet Jupiter, things like that. It looks like there's at least a blurring of lines. It's not, you know, absolutely clear that Saturn is the planet or vice versa, but it seems like there is more and more willingness to directly associate the two together. Yeah. But like I say, we have to get all the way into the fourth century AD to find that association. Wow. Wow. Yeah. So we're like, you know, what, almost 700 ish years after the time the Greeks started actually connecting their gods to those planets to somebody actually say, oh, yeah, they actually have that. Um, And then when we get a little bit later, we can actually see this then become part of anti pagan polemics, in particular, our friend Augustine of Hippo. In a couple of his works, we can actually see that he's taking this idea of that light over there is literally the god and then you know, mocking pagan belief because of it. It's worth noting, like, you don't find these sorts of uh, Christian polemics against the pagans in older works. You have to go all the way until you get to St. Augustine to actually see that sort of thing. And, you know, he has some, you know, funny little points. It's like, well, if, you know, that planet there is supposed to be Jupiter, the king planet, but it's not even the, the brightest planet in the sky. Well, that's kind of pathetic. Uh, how, how is it that the king of the gods is being outshone by Aphrodite? Um, and he, and you can't also say, well, he's also the furthest away because Saturn is higher up. So you would think in like ranking, okay, Saturn is now master of the universe, even though in all the legends, you know, the myths, he's the one who's, you know, kicked down and, you know, is sent yeah. into Tartarus, but now he's actually at the top of heaven. What? <laughs> Interesting. So he's, you know, making fun of that. Um, he also, in one of his other works, um, also like takes the ideas of Euhemerus and saying, hey, the gods were originally these dudes and then the dudes just associated the names with the planets in the same sort of way when like Caesar's comet was said to actually be Caesar's soul going up into heaven and just saying, that's the sort of thing that's going on here. Mm -hmm. And so the reason those planets are even called after gods is just it's old hero worship. And you guys are confused thinking the planets actually are gods. How foolish you pagans. Now come and worship our god man as we have him for our meal. (laughs) Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, you know, in some ways in this polemic that Augustine has, it seems like he's trying to straw man the position a little bit. So even here, I wouldn't say it's absolutely clear evidence that that's what the pagan practice was, but at least at this point, that's how he's interpreting things and using it to attack. And we don't find this sort of attack in Tertullian or other, you know, uh, people attacking heretics or attacking pagans. And of course, nowadays, we think we know better. Planets are not gods. Yeah. They're so much better. Now, when does, when does these, I think you might be getting to this. So if just mm. if you, tell me if you are or not. But when does these names that we know today, 
moon, sun, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. When do those get attributed to the actual planets? Well, basically, they're already attributed in um, the time of the Romans. So okay. um, the sun is Sol, the moon is Luna. And then, you know, we call it um, moon instead of Luna just because English is based on German. So you go to Germany, that object is the moon. So, so it's just so you think language. that Roman England, basically, in the fourth century, time of Venerable Bede, fifth, sixth century, this was already, this was just passed down by the Romans and just, it ne there never was an actual time where... This was just a Roman thing, and it got passed down to the people in the in the, in the north, basically. Yeah, the only uh, stuff I can find in um, Europe throughout that time is maybe an argument whether they should be using the Latin names or the Greek names for the planets. Wow, can you imagine if we're using the Greek names? That'd be pretty cool, actually. Yeah, um, then there was a couple of Christian astronomers in the 17th century who said, hey, we shouldn't be, you know, calling these planets after these pagan god names. We should give them good Christian names. So instead right. of uh, Mercury, um, which, you know, that should be the uh, planet Joan, uh, John, that should be the planet Paul, that's Peter, uh, that's planet Mary or things like that. It, it didn't yeah. stick, but it was an attempt to try to de-paganize the, uh, the cosmos. I'm surprised it didn't happen. I'm glad it didn't happen, though. Yeah, for whatever reason, it just stuck around, and not only is it sticking around, but but actually, uh, I'm going to show you some examples of not only does it stick around, but modern astronomers are just like, we're going to take these mythological names and crank it up to 11 and use them more and more and more. Wow. So, let's go to, well, before we go on, favorite planet besides Earth? Mine? Yes. Saturn. Oh, yeah. Saturn. I don't even have to think about that. What? Look, just look at Saturn. It just looks so cool. <laughs> definitely a good choice. Definitely a good choice. Only downside for Saturn, it's really hard to walk on its surface because it's a gas giant. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I'm too worried about that. I don't think I'm ever going there anytime soon. I think I'm not with that <laughs> attitude. <laughs> um, is that is it true that Saturn has, or is this Jupiter maybe, has that sort of hexagon on top that's like naturally formed? Or is this some conspiracy theory? No, no, it's not a conspiracy theory. Yeah, there, there is a hexagon sort of formation uh, at the poles of Saturn. Um, I don't know the physics that explains that. I have not looked into that well. Really that's due picture. to the, yeah. I found a really good picture yeah. that I can show people. But yeah, go ahead. Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, it definitely is a real picture, but I don't uh, know the physics well to explain why that is and if it's it is a topic a really, of research. It is a really weird thing because... Um. Well, first of all, Saturn is the seventh planet, but okay, never mind. Isn't no, it's actually kind of six. So now, wouldn't that be strange if this was the sixth planet away and it had a six side, six side? That would be kind of weird. But like, you know, it's it's so funny that it's like our it's like our solar system. How we have we almost have twelve moon cycles in in it, but it's just yeah. off by five days, and it's like everything almost looks like it's been created and fixed perfectly, but it's like. It's like something made a mistake and then just said, I'm out of here. You guys are, you guys are on your own. I'm not going to, I'm done here. I'm done being the God of this universe. Yeah. I screwed it yeah, up. The, the, yeah. The universe is a up. gigantic, yeah. The universe is a gigantic created machine with uh, all these gears, but nobody has been oiling the machine. It's gotten quite yeah. rusty. So everything's kind of off. <laughs> everything's off. Just a little touch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all right. So yeah, I agree. Uh, if I could get into spaceship and go up close, I would totally want to see Saturn. But if I wanted to go to a planet and take a stroll, I know my choice has to be Mars. And Mars, mind you, we've learned so much about Mars since antiquity. So, for example, it was only in more modern centuries that we actually know that Mars has moons. And the Greeks didn't have this knowledge. They didn't have names for it. So the official names for these two small moons are Deimos and Phobos, which are sons of Ares. And their names mean terror and fear. <laughs> Wow. Which is a good name for the sons of a war god. <laughs> yeah, they would do sacrifices to Phoebes before a war. Because that was like you're you're offering sacrifice to fear. And that would yeah. that was like supposed to like take the fear out of the soldiers, which I probably doubt happened. I'm pretty sure they were all still <laughs> having a lot of fear before before it's taking a spear and sticking another person, hoping that no one does it to you. Yeah. Can you imagine you know, that? that that is something about actually military tactics back then, and I don't know enough. When those soldiers are going in, are they sober? Who knows? Because I, I get the feeling you need some liquid courage to do such a, a thing. 
Right. You th- we think modern warfare is bad. Can you imagine being face to face, sticking yeah. spears in people and getting spears stuck in you and like just crazy, insane yeah. warfare back then? Oh, yeah. <sighs> oh, and of course, if we go to Mars, we'll actually discover that's where the gods really live. Oh, by the way, doesn't there isn't there Titan, uh, one of the moons of Saturn, or is that? Oh, we, we're going to get there. Okay. I'm going to go one planet at a time right now. <laughs> yeah. But the cool thing is, if you actually also go to Mars, you can find the actual home of the gods. On Mars is this gigantic extinct volcano, and it is the tallest mountain in the entire solar system. The base of this thing is also gigantic. If you superimpose this onto the Earth, this mountain is about the same size. Its base is about the same size as France. And it's just a mountain. (laughs) And it is appropriately called Olympus Mons. It's Mount Olympus. So if you really want to hang out with Zeus and the boys, you got to get your butt to Mars. Yeah. (laughs) Now, so when do these... These are later discoveries, obviously. Oh, yeah. Well, now, what do you th- do? You think there was some influence on naming these planets to to be, to line up with mythology? Oh, completely. Uh, yeah. uh, the astronomers who did all this naming they they knew all these sorts of stories, and they are purposefully attaching that to these uh, things in the naming conventions. That that is have... so cool, isn't it? Yeah. Like the fact. Oh, that in they... fact, it, and it is actually standard that if you go to the various planets, as I'll be showing you, the various names of the moons are going to be associated with their um, mythological counterparts. That is just so cool because what they're doing is they're taking an ancient mythology, ancient world of mythology and putting it out into the stars and making it real. Exactly. Like that is just, you got to love that. It's like, I don't know. It's pretty cool. (laughs) Yeah. And I'm glad they're at least doing that with the planets because a lot of the uh, designations that the astronomers will give to like stars and nebulas and things like that, very often it's just like some sort of index name. It was discovered in this year. It was discovered at this um, uh, right ascension and declination, things like that. So you look up the star name and it's just like a series of numbers. It's just so boring. Yeah. But here with the planets, they tend to be much more creative in the naming. <laughs> right. So if we go then to the next planet out from Mars and we go to Jupiter, we find some interesting stuff there. Mm. So the four most prominent moons, the ones that were discovered by Galileo, their original name was the Medici stars. Right. I've heard this and that was because Galileo, when he discovered them, his main patron was the members Medici. of the Medici family. And basically, um, <laughs> you know who pays the bills. Three? I'm pretty sure he thought uh, there were three at the time, right? Or is it, did he know there was four? He, he knew there were four. Okay. Um, and, you know, later they were renamed. But yeah, he knew these four. He observed them and marked them. And just as also an interesting side thing. So when he's originally writing his notes and his observations, um, he's writing this down in Italian, you know, his native tongue. But then we see all of a sudden, after um, noting the locations of those uh, moons, he realizes something and he starts writing his observations in Latin. The switch in language happens when he realizes the important thing. These moons, these little stars, are going around Jupiter and orbiting it. And that is when Galileo realizes what's going on and he converts completely to Copernicanism. So we can actually get down to the hour when Galileo was convinced that the geocentric view of the universe was wrong. I'm surprised it took Gal. I'm surprised Galileo wasn't already on board. Like, because if I'm not mistaken, heliocentrism became a thing way before that, right? Well, so you have um, uh, Copernicus writing his main tome. It was at 1540. 546 i'm forgetting the exact year right now but basically like you know 50 ish years before galileo starts you know making a name for himself right and it was definitely a minority view in uh europe at that time amongst the uh intellectuals uh the uh, you know the astronomers there they would have copernicus um in their libraries they would actually use it it was uh, copernicus's work was actually very useful for a lot of stuff even though they thought his physics for his solar system were completely wrong, but it still had some utility. Sure. It was only a few minorities of people like Kepler who was completely mesmerized by the idea and fell in love with it. Right. And Galileo had to become a convert, um, a convert to it based on his own observations. Now, was it the church that was behind this sort of keeping this geocentrism alive? Do you think, or, or no? So it was not their direct mission. So when um, 
when uh, Copernicus's work is published, there's really no big fanfare. Nobody's trying to get it canceled or anything like that. Um, the censors didn't, you know, you know, go out of their way to attack it. Now that's in part because um, when the book was sent to the printer, um, the person running the print shop there basically was looking at this and he added his own introduction to it to basically say, um, don't listen to me about the physics of this thing here. This is just some interesting um, instrument uh, calculation stuff. It's not actually real. You read the rest of Copernicus and you realize, no, he really thinks this is what the solar system is like. But that preface that was added to it and pretending to be Copernicus probably helped keep it safe. So nobody was trying to think, well, this is just some, you know, uh, metaphysical nonsense. Interesting. It only really started becoming controversial once people like um, Galileo were starting to make it controversial because he was also then saying, well, I'm now going to interpret the Bible for you. And this is, of course, during the Counter-Reformation when the Catholic Church is like, hey, we, we got to push back on these Protestant bozos. Yeah. Right in the middle of it, too. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So the entire Galileo affair is very complicated. But it wasn't the case that the church was going around and trying to, like, burn all people thinking the earth went around the sun rather than vice versa. They basically, sure. you know, figured it's like that it, it wasn't that big a deal to them until it was kind of more pushed in their face and saying your legitimacy of interpreting the Bible is now being questioned. Right. Yep. All right. But, uh, oh yeah. So all this stuff with Galileo. So he names it after his patrons, the Medici family later, it gets these other names of Io, Europa, Ganymede and Callisto. And these are all from myth various lovers of Jupiter or Zeus. So Jupiter has his lady friends with him orbiting. Now, again, the astronomers have a good sense of humor. So the most recent probe to go to Jupiter, devoted specifically to observing Jupiter, is named Juno, who is the wife of Jupiter. Wow. And as many people are, are joking, now she's there to come and break up the party that Jupiter has been having with his uh, lady friends. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And Juno only got there just a few years ago. It's currently doing um, astronomical research. So, you know, there's exciting new data coming from the Juno probe as we speak. Nice. Now, let's then hop over to your favorite planet. Oh, I'm sorry. Actually, no, I forgot. Oh, so important. Before we hop to, in our important Greek myth, the story of the Trojan War, who wins, who loses, who lives, who dies is ultimately supposed to be decided by the father of the, you know, the master of the universe, Zeus himself. Right. What if I told you that the Trojan War is happening right now in space? Wow. That would be pretty shocking if you revealed that to me. Well, let's be revealed. Oh, the Trojan War. Yes. So there is an official designation for a kind of asteroid as a Trojan. The designation comes about in the following way. So you name these asteroids based on its orbital properties. In particular, when you have two massive bodies, such as Jupiter and the sun, there will be these points where the combination of those two bodies, uh, gravitational force and the centripetal force of the orbit will nicely balance out and you can stably stay in a location. These are called the Lagrange points. And the Lagrange points known as Lagrange points four and five are nice stable places and you will find a bunch of asteroids naturally collecting there because it's a stable place for them to remain. And in the orbit of Jupiter, there are these two Lagrange points uh, filled with asteroids. One set, it called, what's called Lagrange point four, which is in the direction that Jupiter is moving. Those are called the Greek asteroids. Hmm. And in the other Lagrange point, which is behind Jupiter in its orbit are called the Trojans. And right in between the two is Jupiter himself. Wow. So you literally have the two camps of the Trojan War on opposite sides of Jupiter. So did they, is this, was when they were naming planets, I mean, how is this, this is a coincidence, are you saying? Like, what is this? Oh, no, this, this, this was completely done on purpose in the late 19th, early 20th century, this naming convention. Oh, wow. That now, is so cool, dude. Oh, yeah. And they actually, um, the naming convention also, you know, only came into place in the 20th century, which actually causes an interesting problem. So those various asteroids, uh, those various Trojan asteroids and Greek asteroids, some of them were named before that convention was invented. So in the Greek camp, there is an asteroid named Hector. What about Aeneas? Uh, he, if he has a name, I'm not sure there. Uh, but also in the Trojan camp of asteroids, there's one named Patroclus. Oh, so wow. there's a Greek among the Trojans and there's a Trojan among the Greeks. <laughs> that is so fascinating. 
Yeah, so it's a joke whether you're saying that like they're spying or or Hector is literally in the Greek camp right now causing mayhem. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, so if you want to see the actual Trojan, okay, actual Trojan War, just get a decent telescope and look up and you can find it going on. Right. That's like when um I had uh John McHugh on and he was he presented to me that the the flood story is up in the sky. He said Noah's up there right now. He's chilling. He's in his boat. You go look <laughs> up and look. But yeah, it's pretty cool how that is. Yeah, yeah. Again, this is you know completely you know just invented convention in the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. It's not based on actual observations or puns or things like that. It's just like, well, we got all this stuff related to Jupiter. Let's show that we actually paid attention in our mythology class. <laughs> yeah, we have a super chat from Samantha Pedigree. All right. Thank you for that super chat, Samantha. Does Helen of Troy have a star? Um. I would not be surprised if there's an asteroid named after Helen, but I don't know for sure. I would have to check that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, there's because there's, there are so many asteroids, um, there are asteroids with all sorts of names, including named after like modern scientists. There are lots of uh, uh, people that either were scientists or friends of scientists who got an asteroid named after them. Robert Herring says, can I see the war with my 16 inch dobe? A dob, a dobsonian. It's a kind of uh, a telescope. With 16 inches uh, that wide, I'm pretty sure you could. Um, could you see it with naked eye or would you have to use a camera? Because again, the asteroids don't give off really that much light. That's a good question. And I don't know without trying that myself. Uh, my guess is you probably want a decent camera and hold the exposure open long enough to actually see the asteroids. And again, to actually even know that they're asteroids and see them move, you'll have to take uh, pictures probably a couple hours apart to see any motion. So, you know, if you have a 16 inch Dobsonian, you probably know everything I'm telling you about even better than I do. <laughs> yeah. But it's still so fun to get out there when it, when it's a clear summer sky and just get out there and look at these stars. Cause they are so, it's so like science is more fascinating than, than myths sometimes, because you just look up and you see you're looking into eternity. You're looking into light years of just, stars and planets and who knows what's out there and you're just like you you're you just get to look at it like you're it's such a, th a crazy thing if you if you think about it you know oh yeah and when it comes to the crazy oh we got to get to saturn because there's some amazing crazy stuff going on yeah. there yeah let's get to it because now we already know about the rings of saturn and again those were discovered thanks to the telescope galileo was the first person to observe them and since then the images have gotten better and better and better and of course we have found that saturn has tons and tons of moons and well we got to have a naming convention for them so mind you it is worth noting that saturn or chronos isn't technically a god he's a titan right so the various naming conventions of the moons of Saturn also have to be named after other Titans and giants, not gods generally. Right. So for example, one of the moons I have up there in the corner, uh, that one's called Mimas. But to use a line, that's no moon. What does it look like? Uh, that looks like the Death Star. Holy shit. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually nicknamed the Death Star. <laughs> Wait, when did they find this? Oh, uh, these pictures, I well, uh, the picture there I have is, I'm pretty sure, from the Cassini mission. And if not that, it must be from one of the Voyager probes. Wait, wait, wait. So you're telling me that that George Lucas or whoever thought of this Death Star and then they found this later after that? Or is, is it the yes. other way around? Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Because uh, we only discovered this moon either, you know, I think... It might have no first way. been like with good images like this with the Voyager probe. Voyager 1 was only launched in 1977, the same year as Star Wars. Dude, he's a prophet. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait till I show you the moon Jar Jar Binks. George Lucas no, is no. a confirmed <laughs> prophet. I've said it here. I just laid it all down for you. I believe it. <sighs> well... He also, you know, he's also, of course, you know, well informed on mythology. Like one of his favorite books that he carried with him a lot was um, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Yes, yes. Which I have a copy of, which is a great book, by the way. All right. Now, there's lots of moons. And of course, one of the moons is literally called Titan, the Titan named Titan. Not maybe the most original in that, but it's the largest moon around Saturn. It's I think it's the largest moon in the solar system. I keep forgetting if it's the largest or second largest. But here's the thing that's crazy about it. This world is so different than our moon. It has an atmosphere 
and it has lakes. What do you mean? But not lakes of water. Oh, okay. Instead, say- if you go there, it's lakes of ethane and methane. Is it actually a liquid? Like, yes. Jeez, that's some crazy shit right there. In fact, it's not just lakes. There's lakes, rivers, rains. There's an entire water cycle of ethane and methane. What do you think happen if somebody went there with a lighter and lit it? Would it, would it flare up? <laughs> <laughs> well, indeed, this would be quite terrible, you'd think. But there's virtually no oxygen in that atmosphere. So, so there would be no reaction. Yeah, okay. I, I was going to yeah. sit there wondering how it hasn't blown up by now. But but let's just say this much. Um, if you could put a propane uh, uh, store there, you would have you know supply for billions of years to sell. Right. Yeah. That's a lot of barbecue, okay? <laughs> That's so and crazy. And also what's crazy is this is not just a distant world that we've done calculations for or had a quick uh, flyby. We've actually landed on this moon. That picture on the right side is literally taken by the lander called Huygens and was taken back in 2005. Was that a robot? Yes. Obviously. Yeah, we're not sending people there anytime soon. <laughs> yeah, it's like just some no one knows about this, but twenty years ago there's people on on freaking Saturn, and we just <laughs> just telling you here on Gnostic Informant for the first time. <laughs> if people have been there, we are not informed of that. Right. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, this was called the Huygens probe. It was part of the Cassini Huygens mission. Um, Cassini was launched from Earth in 1997 and only got to the planet in 2004 2005. Wow, that's a really good picture too. Oh, yeah. Uh, and yeah, Cassini, uh, it it was a long mission. It took huge amounts of photos and sent back lots and lots of data. It, of course, had this lander go to a moon and take these photos and other instrument measurements. And in 2017, uh, there was actually worry that we can't just let the probe stay there because one of the other discoveries was actually with the moon Enceladus. It actually has geysers of liquid water shooting off into space. And as NASA basically says, when you want to find life, follow the water so the nasa scientists were so worried about the mere possibility that if they just let that probe stay up there it could crash in enceladus and infect it with whatever germs are left on there and if we ever discover life on enceladus we'll think oh it was an infection by accident so they actually had the probe dive into saturn and burn up through there to prevent it even possibly um damaging or contaminating the moons so do do you think that these rings on saturn are there just a uh, thousands of little at little meteors that are flying around it oh yes yeah, yeah there yeah it's just tons and tons of um rocks and dust of various sizes so is um, it possible that there could be a photograph with such good frame rate that you can actually capture like is like it's because it seems like it looks so smooth like how is that is it just because it's that one line going around it and the, there's no, like, I, I'm yeah. just, you know, I'm oh, uh, to- yeah. So you'd have to get closer to it to, you know, see the individual parts of it, but it's also worth noting. So you see this like black line going through it. Yeah. All around. That's actually a gap in the rings. It's actually oh, caused so. by, um, so there are these, what are called shepherd moons and they have a shepherd moons. Yeah. It, they, they call it that because they actually have this uh, interesting gravitational interaction between their gravity, the gravity of Saturn and the gravity of the objects in the, rings that actually where that black line is there's an, a gravitational resonance between the moon and the orbit there which actually kicks out anything from there so that gap is cleaned out by those little gravitational interactions with the shepherd moon wow and when the cassini mission actually was getting to saturn it had to use its rocket to slow itself down to get into orbit and the cassini mission actually went through that gap in the rings wow that's really crazy it's like threading. Now, I would be, yeah, I would be thinking it's like you're trying to thread a needle from like a billion miles away. Right. Uh, I would never dare to do that. But the engineers at NASA, they knew what they were doing. <laughs> that is some. This is why I don't, this, people who are like anti NASA flat earthers, just like they, they, if they had a clue how how much work and effort and how much knowledge and training and studying and education and how like genius these people actually are. Like yeah. they would feel stupid. You know what I mean? It feels so stupid because you're literally opposing like the, the people who are going to secure this, the future of, of civilization. And you're opposing that. Like you, like you're literally putting yourself opposing on the wrong side of history. Like people who do that flat earth shit. You know what I mean? It's true. 
yeah, they're, it, they are definitely not helping the cause for actually understanding the world and growing from it. The yeah. gargantuan amount of knowledge it takes to even get a probe to Saturn is amazing. And the whole purpose of it, so as we could gain even more knowledge. We did not know about the geysers of Enceladus until the Cassini mission. We did not know for sure what was on the surface of Titan until we literally landed on it. And now we can plan more missions to send more probes there in the future. Because for all we know, in those lakes... Maybe something is swimming. We just don't know yet. Wow. You never know. Exactly. And that's that's why we got to, you know, and people do a are better not, job funding this. And if there's someone out there who just laughed at that. Just look at the bottom of the ocean where it's, there's like no sunlight. And the, the pressure is so high that it would crush our skulls. And what do we find down there? Found life. Yep. So if we can find life there, it's almost like... like life adapts to its surroundings not the other way around where we think that there there has to be a certain temperature and certain amount of rain certain amount of water a certain amount of this but it's like we're finding life in areas that don't make sense so we we shouldn't be surprised to find life in areas that we don't think there's going to be life in it's probably yeah, as yeah as was um said by the um famous scientist ian e. malcolm life um uh, uh finds a way yeah and that's my best uh, attempt at doing a Jeff Goldblum impression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So we've come to the edge of the classical solar system. Nice. But we got to keep going. Let's do it. Let's go to how are we going to, what do you want to call the planet? Uh, After Saturn comes what? Uranus. All right. I wanted to see how you oh, want to Jupiter, pronounce it. Jupiter. Because... I'm sorry, Jupiter. No, no. Jupiter was before. Okay. Uranus. Ar yeah. Yeah, and I was trying to see how you're going to pronounce it because basically you either pronounce it the right way and cause children to giggle or you pronounce it another way. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Is that really yep. how you pronounce it? For real? I thought it was Aronos. There are, from what I can tell, there is not a really definitive hard way that you're supposed to. If you said Uranus, most NASA scientists would say that's correct. But of course, the child in them giggles. <laughs> yeah. Uranus. Especially when... <laughs> Especially when you start probing Uranus. By the way, is Titan Uranus in the chat? He's usually watching. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So now Uranus is the name it currently has, but the original name was George. George. Named after the George. king? Exactly. Because it was so discovered boring. by William Herschel in 1781 and named it after his, his lord, King George III. So boring. I'm so glad it didn't stick. Well, here's the thing. This is 1781. So those people fighting in the colonies, they definitely weren't going to name it after George. The people on the continent of Europe, hell no. <laughs> the French are going to be like, yeah, we're going to name this after and call it after a English king. <laughs> no. I <It's> say like, no. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather uh, go back to the ancient ancient Greek yeah. type mythology. Exactly. So the, so like the French and others were like, no, we're not going to name it after English kings or things like that. Let's give it a nice classical name. And so it was given the name of another Titan, in this case, Uranus. Now, the moons, on the other hand, are a bit interesting. Uh, I've only given the names of some of the moons and I've grouped them together. Interestingly, do you see anything pop up with these names? Uh, with, 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 with Titania, Titan, you know, Juliet. Is that like some Romeo Juliet type thing? Is that going? Is that what's going on there? All of the names of the moons are named after characters from the plays of William Shakespeare oh. or the poetry of Alexander Pope. Nice, nice. So yeah, like that first group there, Titania, Oberon, Puck. Those are all characters from a Midsummer a Midsummer's Night Dream, for example. Wow. So like that. The, who yeah, so while the, <laughs> I like Shakespeare. Yeah, so it's the way of saying, okay, so Herschel, yeah, we're not going to name it after the English king, but we'll at least give it some English culture. And this is the only planet that gets that designation. That's fascinating. Now, later, of course, Neptune is discovered by a French astronomer, and the English are going to like, well, we're definitely not going to name it after a French king, so let's give it a nice classical name. And so, yeah, it became Neptune. How does Uranus have a, a ring going the other way or the upward? Oh, so like, Uranus is actually kind of that? weird. The entire planet is actually tipped over 90 degrees, basically. So like when we say like Earth has a 23 and some degree angle, 
uh, that the axis isn't like nice and perpendicular to its orbit. It's off from that by about 23 degrees. Uranus is almost completely sideways. And why that is, is an astronomical mystery. The best guess people have is that might be the result of an early collision in the formation of the solar system. But uh, it is not definitively known one way or the other. The collision hypothesis is the one that most astronomers will ascribe to, though. You know what I just thought of? That's really that's kind of kind of creepy, kind of a coincidence is that Uranus and Saturn were the king of the gods before Zeus, before Jupiter was. Mm -hmm. And they have diadems on their heads. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I should tell you as well that Jupiter also has its own very thin ring. Yeah, so there you go. Oh, that's even crazier. Jupiter has a ring. That's it. The kings yep. and the gods all have diadems on their heads. Ooh. That is some interesting coincidence, yes. Yeah. <laughs> got to admit, you got to admit when they come, I always got to bring them up. I always bring them up. Not bad, not bad. All right. Unfortunately, on Saturn, they don't have any sickles as far as we can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That sucks. All right. So, uh... The last planet, I know some people are going to complain about that. I'll talk about that later. But the last planet is Neptune. Beautiful bluish world, super cold, far away, named after the king of the sea. And so what are the names of his moons? All based on the myths of Neptune or Poseidon. So yeah. Triton is the largest of the moons around there. And Triton is one of the sons of Neptune. I was able to find a nice PNG that I can throw up there. Excellent. Yes. It looks just like the planet, right? <laughs> yeah, it's exactly the same. Identical. Absolutely. Now, how many moons does it have? Two? Uh, oh, oh, far more than two. Um, oh, okay. we're, and we're discovering more all the time. Uh, oh, if wow. we can ever, you know, when we can do observations, we can find more and more. So at least dozens, I think, at this point. Oh, Most wow. of the outer planets have lots of moons. Like um, Saturn has at least 60. Jupiter similarly Uranus has a whole bunch as well as the rings. Uh, yeah. Once you get to the outer solar system, it's just loaded with moons. Wow. Which actually causes a problem because actually <laughs> with Neptune, when I was looking this up, so Proteus is one of the sons of Neptune. Larissa was one of Neptune's lovers, but there have been, you know, oh, there's only so many stories of the children of Neptune. So one of the recent discovered moons and it's the smallest one so far, they actually named it after a mythological water creature called the hippocamp. Wow. Which is uh, like if you took a horse and a dolphin and kind of like smushed them together, that's a hippocamp. Hmm. So there is a moon that was only discovered a few years ago around Neptune and is now named after this mythological water creature. Wow. So like I say, the naming conventions, uh, the astronomers basically say, OK, we're going to prove we know at least some Greco-Roman myths and we're going to impose them onto all the planets. But of course, I say planets. I said Neptune was the last planet, but I know I can hear them in the comments right now. They're, they're right. shouting it. Yeah. Well, what about Pluto? Pluto. I, you got to talk about Pluto. We got to talk about Pluto. I'm sorry. We got to talk about Pluto. That's right. so, Pluto is Neptune. For people who don't realize, Pluto is the Roman version of... Oh, no, no. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Hades. Hades. Yeah. I said Neptune. I meant to say... So this could be Hades. If you, if you want it to be, you could say this is Hades, right? It's the dead planet. It's not a real oh, planet. Yes. It's the dead. It's the underworld. It actually fits, actually. <laughs> well, except that this world is, well, as the old saying goes, cold as hell. <laughs> right. When I say cold, when Pluto is on its most distant part of its orbit from the sun, the atmosphere will literally freeze solid. Yeah. Could you imagine that happening on Earth? Ooh, no, 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 no. No, thank you. Uh, it's also the only planet to have been discovered by an American. Wow. Who was that? Uh, I'm forgetting the gentleman's name. Tongues? I forget. He discovered in the 1930s. Um, uh, yeah, it was a discovery in the 1930s, and they gave it the name Pluto in part from the designation of it being a Roman god, but also the telescope they were using was an observatory that was built by a uh, philanthropist by the name of Percival Lowell. He originally built it so he could observe Mars because he thought at that time that he could actually observe the civilization on Mars, that he thought he could actually see literal canals on Mars. Wow. Um, this ultimately proved to be mistaken, but that was a going hypothesis among some people at that time. So Percival Lowell, he puts a lot of money into building this uh, telescope down in Arizona. And Percival Lowell, PL, maybe that's why they then named it Pluto. <laughs> so I just want to bring this, I just want to pop something up real quick. 
Um, we have a super chat. I'm going to get to it in a second. But okay, so if you look at the the these outer planets, right? They they sort of have nice circles going around the Earth or the, I'm sorry, the Sun. Pluto is like off, but and then mm-hmm. and then this Eris thing. What the hell is that? Is that another planet like Pluto? Like Pluto, yes. So right now, the official designation for Pluto is not planet, but as dwarf planet. So is Eris is one of those things too. Yeah, either it'd either be a dwarf planet or it might be called um, a Kuiper Belt object. So the Kuiper Belt are the various other um, asteroid-like, comet-like objects out there. The Oort cloud is even further out where we think the comets will uh, emerge from. And yeah, these are a whole bunch of small bodies far out and away with much less round orbits. So one of the reasons Pluto lost its designation of planet is you can see that actually its orbit intersects that of Neptune. Sometimes Pluto is closer to the sun than Neptune is, and sometimes it's further wow. away. That's crazy. I did not know that. Yeah. So there's... And then look at Eris. Uns- Eris yeah. touches Neptune's... It looks like it can collide with Neptune. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think if you you know uh, map it out in three dimensions, you'll see that like the chances of collision are absurdly low. But um, yeah, there's all sorts of weird stuff happening there. It could be the case that Pluto was actually a moon of Neptune, but then was kicked out by a gravitational tug from another body. It's... It's up for debate. Nobody knows for sure. Is it possible that Pluto could ever collide with Neptune? Um, Because it has two different cross points there. Yeah. Um, the thing is, though, that it requires them both to be at the exact same spot at the same time. And that is at least exceedingly unlikely at any given time. Um, also, it's worth noting that it's not hard. It's hard to tell from that image, but all the planets are basically, uh, uh, their orbits are all about in the same plane. You can't see oh. it from this image, but Pluto's orbit is also at this weird angle as well. Oh, so, okay. So it would be like, it would have to be like once in a gazillion for it to actually happen. Yeah. Yeah. Which I guess yeah. it was an infinite amount of time. It's, it's <laughs> You could say it's inevitable. Well, we won't have an infinite amount of time. The sun's only going to be shining That's for about another too. 5 billion years. That's true, too. It could, yeah, it could, you're right. You're right. Good point. Yes. Um, now, of course, because Pluto is named after the god of the underworld, it has to also have world of death designation. So its moon, which we've known about since, I think, at least the 1970s, is known as Charon. Hmm. The ferryman across the river Styx. Oh, that's right. Yeah. The dead, the, the dead guy. The, the skeleton yeah. dude. And now this picture is also fascinating because this is only taken in the last few years because we literally sent a probe to shoot past Pluto and it took well over a decade to get there (laughs) and it shot right by, it sent us back photos and one of the first beautiful photos was this one we sent here. So we see this like big white feature there that looks kind of like a heart shape. So it's the heart of Pluto. Wow. Wow. And there are these other regions off to the west in those darker regions. Where's Persephone? Have... Sorry? Where's Persephone? They're Is married. There a moon Persephone? Um, I know another moon of Pluto was discovered, or at least it was called a moon. I don't remember its name, though. Mm. Um, but since they've now been taking pictures of Pluto and trying to name regions, they're now also naming them after regions of the underworld or underworlds from other mythologies. So there is literally a part of Pluto called Cthulhu. Wow. <laughs> this is literally the hell planet. Oh, um, yeah. by the way, Mika Valen, I, we probably already answered this question. This was before we started talking about it. Yeah. But she, she says, is Pluto based on the God of the underworld? Which is, yes, uh, yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah, he's he's basically the same as Hades. Yeah, he rules the underworld. And uh, when you die, you better have some change to pay the ferrymen to get across River Styx so you can get to the land of Pluto. I, I'm so amazed that when they got together and thought of these names for these moons, they went with the myths of these characters in mythology. Like, that's just so cool. Like, it, they, they, they brought to life ancient mythology and put them up in the heavens or the solar system. Yeah, you, you will find that scientists are not only extremely knowledgeable about science stuff, but they nerd out on so much as well. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't blame them. I love this stuff too. Yeah, yeah. and they tried, and, and even more so, they try to diversify their sources. So, like one of these regions is called Meng Po, which was a Chinese deity of the underworld, the uh, god that when you go to the underworld, you first encounter this one and have forgetfulness um, go over you. This is an interesting comment. Pluto has a three-two resonance with Neptune orbits twice every three of Neptune. That's interesting. Mm. And a resonance like that uh, 
uh, I'm going to assume that's true for now. Uh, I, I need to check that out because that sounds interesting. Yeah. Uh, and with that sort of resonance, that probably also guarantees that like the two are never going to accidentally bump into each other. Right, right, right. I think that's what she was getting at. And Robert Herring says, hey, bro, Pluto, I think he means Pluto, <laughs> yeah. is by law a planet in New Mexico? <laughs> I think, yeah, somebody passed some sort of ordinance or some really? law that says within the bounds of the state, uh, because I believe that's where they first like um, had like the first like clear observations of Pluto. And so they're like saying for our heritage, we are still going to declare Pluto a planet no matter what the International Astronomical Union says about anything. Wow. Well, then what about Eris? Wouldn't they have to name it, if, if they're going to go that route, wouldn't they just have to say Eris is the next planet then? Well, that actually was also one of the things that actually made Pluto lose its designation when they were finding right. more and more of these bodies out there and discovering, hey, there's all these bodies that are like similar to the size of Pluto and we're going to discover more. So how many planets are there going to be? We could say there's either eight or possibly 800. <laughs> yeah, that's... And yeah, it's ultimately, well, so right now the official designation of planet has a somewhat arbitrary feature to it. So the three criteria that make something a planet is one, it has to orbit the sun. Two, it has to be gravitationally large enough to become spherical in shape. So that way it excludes asteroids that don't have enough gravity to actually become anything other than like a potato shape. And three, the criteria that has the most controversy, it has to be able to clear out its orbital path. Wow. And that, they used to say, well, because the path of Pluto comes into and, you know, like intersects that of Neptune, Neptune is way more massive. Therefore, Pluto loses its planet designation. Other people will say, well, that's stupid. We're saying Pluto is not a planet because of its location. If we took Earth and put it in Pluto's location, does Earth now suddenly not become a planet? Right. right. So it's still controversial. Um, and most likely what will happen is we'll discover more and more of the outer solar system and find other smarter ways to designate these bodies. That's that's a good idea. Yeah. And by In the way, words, we got to keep sciencing. <laughs> back, back to Eris one more time, since we're on the since we're done with the planets, is that a name based off any mythology? I can't think of anything right now. Eris. I, mean, uh, I forget who that might be for, because yeah, there's <laughs> also a lot of these places have a lot of oh, names. Some okay, of them are not official. It. I just found it. Eris is the goddess of strife and discord. Strife and discord. Okay. Yeah. So it is based off a goddess. I'll oh, show right. you guys. I'll show the guys a picture real quick. Show the people a picture real quick before we go. Yeah, this, just because some of these uh, bodies, when they were first discovered, were given all sorts of other names. Like one of them, because we discovered close to Easter time, they called it Easter Bunny. That was literally the name of the planet for a while. <laughs> That's Eris, and oh, so right. and so yeah, they went with the uh, they went with the tradition and named this planet. I'm putting quote, air quotes, yeah. whatever you want to call this body, after a goddess, and this um, Eris is the opposite of Harmonia. So I guess that's that that makes sense that they would have the goddess who's the opposite of harmonia. It's because it's not in harmony, right? It's not har it's not harmonious with the other planets. It's the opposite. So I think that's probably why they named it that. I think you're right. Uh and of course, while we're also thinking about that, it's also then the case that um, we haven't even talked about the asteroids, which are also named after de deities. Like there's the asteroid series, uh, right. just like the uh, goddess series of cereal. So eventually <laughs> we must colonize Ceres, start growing on it, and then we can say we can have authentic cereal. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So, yeah, we haven't, like I said, even touched the asteroids, of which there are many, many, many. Uh and also have lots of classical names as well. Yeah, but um, this is really fascinating stuff. Is this uh, is this all you have for the presentation? Is this all I have? Oh, I bring you the whole universe, and that's all I got. Yeah. Well, I, I, <laughs> that, that's I, it for the slide deck. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, I love this stuff. I could go. I could. I literally love this conversation, and I think it's. I just think it's really, like we're lucky to have intelligent but also intellectual scientists that can like keep in mind our past and our history and our our, our mythologies of what makes us connect with the with the universe and sort of attribute that to modern science and be able to name all these planets based off the gods and then even have the backstories injected into the names of the of the moons that to me is like it makes science and astronomy that much more better and more fun 
Yeah. And if you go throughout the solar system, there's all sorts of other naming conventions to try to show its legacy. So if you go to the moon, the various seas and craters are named after famous astronomers of the past. Uh, some of them from the um, uh, high point of the Islamic golden age, uh, some from the early modern period and things like that. So the whole solar system is littered with stories. It's awesome. I mean, it's like it's like in the ancient world they had this they had the the star maps based on the constellations, and you had like the the dog star over here. You have, you know, a Taurus over there and Orion right next to it, and then you had this big snake and the serpent. And there there is a story being told in the sky. And now, with this modern with our modern map of the solar system, you sort they sort of inherited these stories and passed them down into the solar system. So I. I it's really, it really is um, something that we can be grateful for, for, for that actually have, because that it could, we could just have N95. Well, my worry is that um, uh, if we didn't have these designations, then the first companies that get to Mars and now we, we call these mountains, it's not Olympus Mons, it's Big Mac or things like that. That would be, <laughs> that would be pretty denigrating to our, our legacy. Coca-Cola. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Buy Coca-Cola. That's the oh, name yeah. of the planet. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. We, yeah, we come to a new world, and the first thing we discover is ads. <laughs> right, it's just ads everywhere. The whole, the whole, the whole universe is just ads. Uh, well, maybe one day we will find aliens, we'll find what they name things, and hopefully they won't uh, come to us and say, what we were really interested in was actually um, your infomercials. That's why we came to this world. <laughs> right. Yep. Well, is there anything you want to anything you want to sh tell us about that's coming up anytime soon that you're doing well um for myself uh nothing too new on there but i will note when it comes to the astronomy news next month start looking out for the first um results from the james webb space telescope we mentioned that before it was launched on christmas day um it is fully deployed it is up and running you might have also heard some news recently that it was hit by a micrometeorite wow. um it's apparently not enough to actually be a huge burden to its operations, but next month we're expecting to maybe see some of the first really good images from it and start doing amazing science with it. And that's just one instrument that's launched right now. Um, we have other things that are orbiting other asteroids, taking data that might be even landing on them in the not too distant future. And of course, you know, this decade humans might be back on the moon. Wow. That's NASA's plan, at least. And then th and with our with our new technology of like instant video, <laughs> that's going to be something because now you're going to have people with cameras that are rolling live, and you'd be able to just turn on NASA's channel and just watch what they're doing. Oh yeah, when you can, I recommend going to the various websites that are doing live streams from the International Space Station or launches from SpaceX. There is so much awesome science going on right now if you know where to look. Wow. And by the way, I put a link in the description for your book. And um, so, yeah, definitely. That's definitely a must read. It's about the Star of Bethlehem. Is it based off something that actually happened in the, st in the, st in the sky? Is this really? Oh, it's that one right there. That star. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> or is it? <laughs> yeah, or is it? So check that out. It's in the description. And um, that wraps it up, if I'm not mistaken, right? I think we're good for tonight. Yes. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over.